The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the October 2018 webinar, HR Best Practices webinar by Thompson Co. Um, this month, the topic, it's a scary Halloween. We've never had a Halloween-themed topic. Um, and actually, I wasn't even thinking about this as a Halloween type of topic and still, until we uh, started putting the materials together for it. But anyway, it's uh, how I hired a serial Killer, Hiring Mistakes and Solutions. So that's going to be our topic today. Um, my name is Kevin Mosher. I'm a partner at uh, Thompson Co. and um, manage the Minnesota office for the firm. Um, if this is the first time that you've, I'm, um, I should say I'm also an MSBA certified specialist in labor and employment law and an HR attorney um, up here and uh, counsel businesses all over the country. If this is the first time that you have joined, welcome. Um, it's nice to have you. And this is a monthly webinar series. We've been doing this for six and a half years now. And um, this is being recorded. Uh, good news for all of you is that, you know, I'm not listening. Um, none of what you're saying to yourselves or writing or anything is being recorded. But uh, my voice is being recorded. So this will be uh, loaded onto the um uh, my HR Genius website, and there's a there's a link to that the thehrgenius.com. You can also find it on the Thompson Co. website. So if you do want to rewatch this or have somebody else at your at your company or organization watch it, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, if you need HRCI or SHRM credits, um, they've been you know authorized, so you'll get your certification after we you know verify attendance and do all the things that we're required to do by SHRM and HRCI. Uh, if you have any questions, you are welcome to write them. Um, I will, if you if you hit the raise your hand thing, um, that happens pretty much every month and um, that's not going to do me any good because I, I'm not picking up audio from any anybody. But if you do type in a question, uh, I will try to get to it. If I don't get to it, I will, I will shoot you um, a response if it wasn't covered in the in the webinar, I'll shoot you a response after afterward. And so I do appreciate everybody's attendance. So this is uh, this is one of my um, you know one of the topics that I really like uh, how you know hiring um, next month we will have the the sister topic to this, which is how I fired a serial killer, um, discipline and documentation and how to fire. So we're gonna have the back to back uh, you know October November. We're going to we're going to talk about hiring. We're going to talk about process. We're going to talk about culture. We're going to talk about a lot of important things um, that are particularly important today versus what they might have been um, five or certainly ten years ago at the height of the Great Recession. So hiring is uh, a big deal. I think companies just you know uh, if I want to get on my non legal soapbox here, I think a lot of companies are spending more money on hiring and process than maybe they did 10, 10 years ago. And I think there's an argument to be made that companies generally are, are, are valuing human resources, which makes all of us who work in the HR world um, very happy and uh, you know feel, feeling loved and, and valued. But I think hiring in particular, hiring and retention um, are becoming more of a focus versus what we're going to talk about next month, which is firing and discipline. I think 10 years ago, uh, my phone rang a lot more th on discipline and documentation and all that. And those are very critical things. And that's a lot of the times what you get sued for. But it, I think as a, as a percentage rings more now than it did 10 years ago on hiring process and what to, what to know and how to do hiring and testing and, and all of that. So I do feel that uh, things have changed over over the years, and that hiring is a is a, a more valuable thing. And I think part of that is just because you know it's just the market's tighter. Um, there's you just have to you know there's a um, a lot of really highly skilled uh, let's just you know say millennials and younger younger people out there. The younger generation has a lot of great skills, and and for the most part the the economy needs that. So. Um, I think hiring those people with those skills is is increasingly critical. 
two most businesses in the United States. So, okay, we're going to talk about process. There is a process that I generally follow. Could you deviate from the process that we're going to talk about? Yes. Um, again, this is an HR best practices series. This is what I believe are the HR best practices as a lawyer that defends companies and advises and counsels businesses, um, you know, all day long. This is what I believe to be the uh, best practice for hiring, for hiring process. We're going to talk about recruitment. Recruitment is where we can, we potentially get into um, uh, legal issues with regard to discrimination. I mean, we can get into with regard to discrimination and all of these, but recruiting is where we really need to watch it. We're going to talk about the application process. We're going to talk about vetting candidates and the interview process. Again, could get into some uh, legal issues around the interview process. And then we'll talk about some strategies and and tips toward the end. And I think that'll round out our our hour. There is also a um, handout that I, I believe was sent email to everybody who had registered in advance. So there was a there was a handout that gets into much greater detail about process and um, uh, it's a, a more in-depth outline. I don't, you know, although I'm, we're looking at a slide with a bunch of graphics and everything, I try not to put too much on the, you know, too much detail in, and, um, uh, you know, information on, on each slide. So, but the handout that you were sent, I think will be valuable to you, or at least it's got some valuable information on it. So, you know, we talked, I had mentioned earlier that, that there is a reason that you want to have a good hiring process. You want to make the right decisions. So this is the Department of Labor, U.S. federal at national level. They look at this and they say that, um, they've estimated that the cost of a bad hire is about 30% of that employee's um, annual first year of, of wages. So if you're hiring somebody for $24,000 uh, and they don't, you know, pan out and you, you know, have to then go and recruit and, and do all of that and the hiring process and the time and, and the loss of productivity and not having that person and, and all the different factors that go into this. So the Department of Labor on a $24,000 employee estimates that, that it's going to cost your business about $8,000 uh, to do that. Now, it certainly could be would be more if you're using a recruiter and you're, you're also paying the recruiter a percentage, you know, whether it's, you know, 15, 20, 30, 40 percent, whatever it is. Um, obviously that's going to be, but for a typical employee where there's no recruiter costs, where you're, you're maybe posting online or you're having word of mouth recruiting, you're still looking at about 30% on average. And a lot of this is downtime is lost time is lo is lost productivity, but it's a real incentive. Uh, that 30%, that's a real incentive for companies to reinvest and to, uh, value the, the, um, hiring process, the HR hiring process. And, you know, for all of you, uh, all of you that know me know that I'm an absolute HR cheerleader. Uh, and so I, you know, definitely come to this from, um, from a position of biasness, but it really is important for businesses, uh, down, downturn in the economy or not, or upturn in the economy, it doesn't matter. I just really think that having good HR practices on the hiring side is, um, is something that businesses should be valuing, uh, more than they historically have. And again, every company is different and there's different culture and, and all that, but I just generally think that HR should be uh, more valued on the hiring side. So talent, talent recruiting side. Um, okay. So here is the outline that I gave you in the handout will be much more in depth on this. And we're going to talk a little bit more than just this checklist, but this is the general flow of, of how I, um, how I look at these things. And for those of you that know me, you know, that, um, look, I know that job descriptions are a pain in the neck. And I know they're difficult and they're sometimes too verbose and they oftentimes don't reflect what the actual job is. But for me, it all starts with the job description, the written job description, the whole hiring process. That to me is step one. If I have a manager coming to me and saying, hey, I've got the budget, 
uh, it's been approved by you know up the chain that I've got the budget I need to hire or I need to you know hire to fill or hire for this new position if I'm in HR I don't even bother you know giving them the time of day until we have hashed out an updated job description um, and and it's so critical, you know, it's the whole garbage in, garbage, garbage out type of thing. But to have an understanding of the job, if you don't have an understanding of the job, how can you possibly ask interview questions? How are you possibly going to know? The other thing is that jobs change. Jobs change all the time. Um, and they, they evolve and they evolve, but they change all the time. And so we're not just talking about new jobs where you have to do a job description. We're talking about current jobs, jobs that have been out there. If you have a job, that ha a job description that hasn't been updated in at least a year, and if the manager is coming to you saying, hey, I want to hire for this position, if you haven't had a conversation with them about the job itself and have just talked about it and maybe just sat down and looked at the job description and updated the duties, particularly the duties, but also the, the eligibility, the um, the criteria like educational credentialing and and other requirements that you need for the job so not just the performance of the duties but the educational requirements right so if you haven't done that i think um i think it's a poor practice and i and i think that you're going to lessen your uh your percentage your ability to find a good candidate for the job because you're not going to you're, if you don't really know what you're looking for how are you possibly going to find some somebody who's excellent and i think that's where there's a lot of waste wasted money on recruiting uh because you're you know you're paying for advertising you're paying with time and obviously lo loss of productivity while the while the manager whoever needs needs that person the job so for me there's a lot of work being done at the front end about understanding the position and doing the job description and getting it right. And the job description, there's nothing, I don't think in your materials or anything about that. There's no magic to a job description, but it generally flows like this. Brief description of the job, little couple sentences, you know, describing the job, primary duties of the job. If you're really good at this, you do secondary duties. So you've got the primary duties, and why do we care about that? We care about that just in case the person has a disability or for whatever reason has some sort of limitation. We need to understand what the primary duties are. This is really important from a legal perspective that you can articulate what the primary, the essential duties of the job are. And then you might actually have secondary duties. So these are the primary duties. These are the secondary duties. You might list all of that. If you just list all of everything um, that's typical, that's what people normally do. But I personally, I really like to uh, note and have it uh, have it identified which are the primary duties, in particular the primary duties. If you leave the secondary duties off, that's that's fine. But um, but I want to at least capture on the job the written job description what the primary duties are, and then driving from the primary duties and secondary duties potentially too. But driving especially from the primary duties, then you're going to get to the third part of the job description, and it's going to be the eligibility criteria. What do you need? Is it does it require a job degree? If it's if it's a lawyer position, you have to have a JD, and you have to have passed the bar, right? So that's in the state that you're going to practice. So you're going to have to have that. That's got to be on the job, the job description. So often I see job descriptions and they will be for highly professional employees and they won't say that there's a job, that there's a job, uh, um, a college degree requirement. And you talk to the manager and they would never hire somebody without a college, uh, a college degree in a specific field. Let's just say it's, you know, a computer programmer and you absolutely would never think about hiring somebody if they didn't have uh, an information science degree or a computer programming degree or computer science or something something along those lines uh, or the equivalent. But it's not in the job description. Oh my gosh. Well, it absolutely should have it in the job description because otherwise, if you get to it, and then oftentimes the managers will be like, well, yeah, you don't, oh, you don't have a, you don't have a, a degree. Well, then you get peppered with, you get peppered with, uh, you know, a bunch of, applicants that that don't meet what is in the head of the manager being the requirement for the job. The other problem from a discrimination standpoint and, and best practice standpoint is that if you have one manager 
who might be in the same department, you know, big department, and you have one manager who's hiring for his team, and then you've got another manager who has employees on her team, and one manager has different eligibility uh, expectations than the other manager, well, that's a real problem. If they're all computer, you know, computer scientists, and they're doing essentially the same duties, you should have the same type of expectations and eligibility criteria. So again, that's why we want to have it, we want to have it down, we want to have it in writing, we want to make it very clear to the candidates. So when we're conducting the interviews, we, we are driving the interview questions, off of what is in the job description and what what are the duties and what are the eligibility criteria. Otherwise, how are we going to weed out people legitimately uh, who might not meet the, the criteria that we expect? So have to understand the position. We then want to look into recruiting. We need to choose, we need to select a method for recruiting. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, we want to do the, the, we're going to flow, we're going to do the applications. So we've recruited, we're going to get applicants, we're going to do the review, we're going to apply the criteria that we have assigned to this review. Is the, is it going to be requiring a specific degree? Is it going to be requiring a certain number of ye years in the field? If you're a uh, manufacturer, do you need to have somebody with specific manufacturing experience? If you're an engineer, do you need to have somebody who's specifically engaged in structural engineering or you know whatever it is um, before you know you need to have the criteria you l review the applications you can then select the people you schedule the interviews so those people who you select you schedule the interviews you conduct the interviews so this is just flowing right so we, but starting with the understand the position we evaluate the candidates based on the interview based on the job application and based on anything else if we're doing writing samples any other type of information that we are collecting on the situation we are then going to apply pre-employment conditions the i-9 completion of the i-9 to prove that the person has work authority in the united states is a pre-employment condition if that's the only pre-employment condition you have so be it but just know that's a pre-employment condition a lot of other pre-employment conditions could be skills testing, could be, um, so it could be, so this is post-offer pre-employment, could be background check, could be drug testing, social media check. So that whole list right, right there, there might be other types of uh, conditional offer things made. It's going to be detailed if there are conditions to the offer, it's going to be detailed in your offer letter. You should be doing offer letters. Offer letters don't have to be magic. Uh, there's no like federal law that says you have to do an offer letter. It needs to go in the employee personnel file if you do an offer letter, and most people, most companies should be doing offer letters, but an offer letter doesn't have to be magic. It should set out the criteria, the, the conditions that need to be met before the person starts to work. So if it, there's going to be testing involved of any kind, it should set it out. If there's going to be a background check, it needs to, it needs to set it out. It should be out in the offer letter. The, the classification as exempt or non-exempt should be in the offer letter. General welcome to the company should be in the offer letter. Again, the offer letter could be about half a page. It's the, it's the opening written document that you have to um, put yourself in the favor of a new employee, right? Consider it marketing um, to some extent if you want. It should set the tone and encourage the person to be excited about joining your your company your organization so but from a from a detail standpoint the offer letter should have the rate of pay or salary it should have a explanation as to whether or not the person ex is exempt going to be exempt or non exempt it should have the title maybe even the name of the supervisor who they're going to be reporting to and then it should have it should set forth other conditions that need to be met the offer letter should also have a place for the prospective employee to sign and date and return it to you accepting the offer. Now that's not a contract and you should say it should say also in the offer letter that's employment at will um, and you know either you know so employment at will the standard the standard phrase employment at will you or the company can terminate your employment at any time with or without any reason whatsoever. Um, so that needs to be said uh, stated in there. Could you withdraw the offer? Absolutely. Um, could you withdraw the offer even if the person's made all the conditions of employment, could the person show up day one and you say, you know what, I am so sorry, something happened, we're closing down the location, whatever it is. You come up with whatever, you know, the 
the uh, uh, Dallas Cowboys lost this weekend. I'm just feeling really bad about this. We we decided not to. I'm super miserable. I can't think about hiring somebody. We're we're going to fire you. Yeah, you could. Is it um, like good for your company's image? Probably not. But um, could you fire somebody? Could you withdraw an offer once it's made? Yeah, yeah, you you could. It's not a contract, and you want to make you want to make it clear in the offer that it is not a contract. So this is the general flow um, of the of the process, and then we're going to do orientation orientation with the person. Most companies do orientation of some sort, signing the employee handbook, receiving the employee handbook, filling out all the benefits information, um, emergency contact information, that sort of thing. Okay. So what do we need to do? So going back to the job description, what do you, what do we need to do? We really need to sit down. And again, if it's been a, if it's been more than a year and obviously a year is just, you know, my general, my general take, there's no law on this, but if it's been more than a year since you've updated the job description, now is your time. Update the job description, talk to the manager, the direct manager. Um, as much as I love HR people, um, and again, big booster, uh, HR people are not on the floor doing the actual work. Um, of the job itself. So you might know the company really well. You might be able to fill out 70% of the job description, but it's that 30% that really, that's like the special sauce, right? So that's what you really need to talk to the manager and the supervisor about to get a real feel for the, for the job so that it can be reflected in the job description. I wouldn't let them, and you know, you might want to give uh, give pushback to managers and supervisors if they just start saying like everything under the sun is an essential job duty. You know, that's that's when it's time for you to say, okay, let's just, let's boil it down. Take me through the day. What's a typical work day for this employee? Let's talk about what they really need to do. Let's talk about what you really need from an from uh, you know a background and eligibility criteria standpoint. So you're going to update that. You're going to decide exempt versus non-exempt. Employers screw that up all the time. Exempt is not just somebody who gets paid a salary. Uh, and I've got entire webinars on this, and if you want to watch them, they're at the, the hrgenius.com website, and you're, you're more than welcome to do so. Send me an email. I'm happy to send you a link if you can't find it. Um, exempt versus non-exempt. Obviously, it you know, um, so there's, you know, exempt employees are for the most part in a professional basis and uh, professional white collar employees are paid a salary. That's true. Could you pay a salary to non-exempt employees? Absolutely. Non-exempt employees just mean that you have to pay them overtime. So we need to understand just because, just because a job um, has historically been classified as exempt. This is your opportunity, again, with reviewing the eligibility criteria, with reviewing the, the, um, the primary functions of the job. This is your opportunity to also re, uh, to analyze, to determine, reassess whether or not these people are appropriately exempt or non-exempt. You can make everybody non-exempt. You'll never violate the law. That's fine. The question is, are you in violation of the law when you classify people as exempt and don't pay them overtime because you're classifying them as exempt? Um, one example for you would be if if I'm a if I'm a company and I, if I employ engineers, I've seen this a number of times over the over the years, where you have engineers and the company has engineers who are degreed engineers and engineers who are not degreed they've they've um, got it they've got the the expertise through um, through work experience so and they've classified all of them as exempt not a good idea um, you should make two different classifications two different jobs Engineer one, engineer two. Engineer one would be the engineers who don't have a, a degree, a specific degree in engineering. They should be non-exempt. The uh, engineers who have a degree in engineering, that could be engineer two. They could be exempt. You need to separate them out. If you call all engineers exempt, um, that's that's going to be inappropriate because uh, because of the professional exemption rules. So that's just an example of, and then you would want to. Uh, um, you know, note that on the job descriptions for both, that one might require, you know, five or six or seven years of uh, work experience, engineer one, and then one just might require zero years of experience, but a four-year degree in engineering. So we want to really set that out. It's got to be reflected in the job job description. 
in doing that, we also want to make we also want to find out: Do we need to do pre-employment testing or screenings? Are are we going to do any sort of testing that's going to make that's going to be conditioned on the person passing in order to be eligible for the, for the job? Um, for example, just go with my engineering uh, degree. We might we might do some sort of testing on math or engineering principles, just to make sure that the person's qualified. It doesn't have to be you know some huge psychological profile, or it doesn't have to be a medical test of any kind. But any sort of testing, knowledge based testing, could also be something that's a pre -con precondition. We might do that um, knowledge type of testing with the with the application itself. Okay. So we've got the job description. We've we have identified whether or not we want to do any sort of pre-employment testing, post post offer, pre-employment testing. Um, so we've identified all that. We understand the job. Now we can recruit. If we don't understand the job, we can't recruit effectively. Now we can recruit because we understand. We've talked to the manager. We've we've laid it all out. We understand the essential duties of the job. Now we can recruit. Now we have to determine. And this is where lawyers get concerned. How are we going to recruit? If you're just going on Indeed or Career Builder or one of the internet based recruiting sites, that's fine. I think that's that's um, you know that's an appropriate way to uh, to recruit. Um, might not be the most effective for your job and your location or anything, but it but it, you know is it non discriminatory? Yes, um, assuming that the language of the job description is you know written from you know well and not discriminatory but the 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 process itself using uh using indeed or career builder or some sort of some sort of um you know internet based there's no real discrimination there if we if we are looking at um, being more specific with the recruiting we are sending maybe we're sending recruiters to colleges Probably okay if we're depending on what the judge, but again, we have to understand what the you know you might want to send a, a recruiters to engineering schools to recruit. That makes a lot of sense. And again, we're probably not going to run into some sort of discrimination by doing that. But there are types of discrimination that we we want to watch out for when we talk about recruiting, like word of mouth and um, recruiting solely through referrals from current employees, right? Just because um, you know the way that EOC looks at this is if you've got 90% of your workforce is Caucasian and you say, hey, you know, we're going to recruit from people that all of our 90% Caucasian uh, employees know, you're going to probably continue to get 90% uh, of your workers, um, your applicants be Caucasian. And so that would be a potential problem depending on what the demographics are of, uh, of your region. So if it's, you know, 90% in the middle of you know, um, Northern Minnesota, uh, you'd probably be like a super diverse, diverse company with 10% um, non-Caucasians, but 90% uh, in uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul or Chicago or Detroit or Dallas, you're, that's, you know, that's going to um, uh, raise the ire of the EOC. And they're going to see that as a potentially discriminatory recruiting method. If you're just asking your current population of employees to uh, provide referrals. So we want to look at, we want to definitely focus on non-discriminatory ways to recruit. Um, then we're going to, we're going to look at the application. We want to make sure that we've got criteria set, um, that we're going to use neutral, non-discriminatory criteria when assessing who we're going to make the offer, um, the interview offer to, and then we're going to do the interviews themselves. And so there's, you know, just legal issues that come up with all of these. Here's some some um, lists of uh, of different ideas for for placing for recruiting. And again, we always want to be mindful that we're not targeting. Now, I say that, but if you've got an affirmative action plan in place, you're a government contractor or receive government government funding, something like that, and you've got an affirmative action plan, an AAP in place. We want to be mindful in the recruiting. You're going to want to be mindful in the recruiting that you are um, following the AAP and the recommendations, and that you're trying to recruit within other, um, you know, underrepresented fields based on your current demographic breakdown, right? So if you are low percentage of your worker, if, if you're if the percentage of your workers, uh, Hispanic workers, for example, is under what the demographics say they should be and your AAP says you know that that you're going to try to recruit 
um, you know, more Hispanic workers, then it seemed, then it would, it would be appropriate at that point. So we're going to, you know, use some sort of, you know, put in the newspaper, like the general newspaper, um, like Chicago Tribune or LA Times or New York Times. We're going to put in a general, general newspaper that has a wide circulation. We're going to put it online, Career Builder, Indeed. We might do that as well. But we could also specifically try to recruit in like a Spanish speaking um, newspaper or maybe some sort of um, job fair that's more targeted toward Hispanic, uh, prospective Hispanic workers. So we can do that, but we don't want to do that exclusively. So we, we definitely, you know, especially when we're doing AAP, when we have AAPs, we, we can target uh, we can target who we're trying to go to try to get a more diversity to meet the expectations of the AAP, uh, the requirements of the AAP. But we also def we also still want to have other more general general audience um, type of type of rec recruiting going on. So job fairs might be something that again there are specific targeted job fairs, but then there are also more ge uh, general ones like at colleges. And um, and stuff like that, or or that are more industry based, but aren't specifically targeting a, uh, a specific population or employee demographic. We've got employment agencies as well uh, that can do the, re the recruiting. That can be definitely um, a neutral and um, non discriminatory method. So so you've got just a bunch of different places for recruiting. I don't think any of that's probably too um, too novel for anybody. So, uh, non-discriminatory recruiting. We want to look at the. We want to do the interview. This is how. Um, so how we can get how we can watch out how we can do the non-discriminatory um, stuff. But what we want to watch out for is in this process, whether it's the interview or the recruiting itself, we want to watch out for asking questions about family members, about family. Now. This comes up a lot in interviews. It's come up for me in interviews when I've when I've been interviewing people. Sometimes the applicant opens the door themselves, right? And so this is a typical HR conundrum, right? So we've got family members, and the person the person might come in. You might be talking to them, and you might be saying, "Well, I see you had a period. You know, I see there's a gap in employment of unemployment." of like two two years here i just want to i want to understand what that is you don't you can ask about that right you might know hey the person took maternity leave they took paternity leave they decided you might be able to read the tea leaves on this one but you can definitely ask it's not discriminatory to say you know i, I see there's a gap uh in employment um is was there you know what's the what's going on with that gap of employment of employment. And again, you would only ask if it's important for ultimately for the job. If it's not important for the job that you're recruiting, that you're interviewing for, don't bother asking it. But if it but if it is something that's important to know, then ask why there's a gap of employment. And if the person says, oh, you know, had a baby, uh, baby's now two years old, and it's time for me to get back into the workforce, could you, like a human being, ask, what's your baby's name? Um, yeah, you could. I don't I really, you know, I don't lose sleep over over that sort of thing. You're just being nice. Um, you know, you don't need to ask about medical complications. Did you get a cesarean section? You know, did you, was this a natural birth? Don't bother with that stuff. That's not really important for the job. But if you just want to kind of be, um, you know, uh, a member of society and ask uh, somebody who's sitting there for an interview when they've opened up the door to say, like, I have children, I am married, I have a spouse of some sort, um, could you ask, oh, yeah, what's his or her name? Uh, then, you know, whatever. Yes, it's okay. I wouldn't dwell too much on it. I wouldn't get into specifics. But if you just want to be courteous, um, I, I don't think the law prohibits courteous behavior. You don't want to ask questions about citizenship. Getting to it. You can put on your job description, uh, your job application, you know, are you authorized to work in the United States? Yes or no. Are you authorized to work in the United States? Check if they check yes, good enough. I wouldn't bother asking it at the interview. If you ask, and a lot of companies ask this, especially companies that are recruiting at colleges, if you ask, will you require visa sponsorship? Are you authorized to work, yes or no? Second question, will you require sponsorship of a visa by the company? 
yes or no? And if the question is yes, then at the interview, it's appropriate for you to ask what um, sort of visa sponsorship would they need? They're probably, if they're, especially if they're being recruited out of college, they're probably on an F visa, student visa, and they're probably going to work for you on um, OPT, uh, optional practical training, for a year to 29 months after uh, after they graduate, at which point they would need an H-1B visa probably. So it's fair to ask that, and you can actually, um, that's not a citizenship question, you can actually uh, not not make offers to those sort to the employees in that situation because you know you might have a policy of just not uh, sponsoring anybody for for visas. We want to watch out for stereotypes. Disability questions are the ones that we really need to watch. Be careful of if somebody comes in and they have an obvious limitation, physical mental limitation you can't ask about the limitation itself. And again, this is why we need to know what the job description, what the essential functions of the job are. If it's listed that the essential function of the job is that you lift or push or pull 50 pounds or more, or at least 50 pounds, and if the person comes in and, they're, and they have a walker, it's fair for you to look at the job description. Hopefully you've given a copy of the job description to the you know, person being interviewed. And it's fair for you to say, you know, I, um, there's a 50 pound lifting, pushing, pulling restriction. Is, are you going to be able to, um, you know, is that an essential requirement for this job that you'll be qualified for with or without an accommodation? And if the person says, oh, I didn't see it, well, there you go. They're not, they're not, they don't meet the eligibility criteria for the job and you can consider them, you know, because they, they might have a back condition of some sort. But if the person says, oh, you know what, the walker, I, this is just a slip disc. This is totally temporary thing. Doctor said I was going to be better in, uh, in a few weeks. I, it, I won't have any problem with the 50 pound. Fair enough. They, check it that they're going to meet the eligibility criteria if the if the slip disc thing lingers then you have to then you might want to take a look at some sort of accommodation temporarily but but that's where we want to ask we want we we only want to ask about limitations that are obvious at the interview if the um if it reflects on the essential functions of the job and that's again why we need to have the job description clear and detail everything. Um, other thing to watch out for membership in, you know, lodges or organizations and groups. I, whenever I, I actually put lodges in there to kind of as a joke. The EOC always talks about lodges as if lodges are a thing. Um, it always makes me, you know, think of the old honeymooner um, episodes. And I know there are lodges out there probably um, that people are affiliated with, but uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know anybody in them, um, so I don't think they're as big of a deal as they probably used to be back in the day. So anyway, we want to make sure not to ask people about their affiliation with lodges, at lodges, organizations, groups, you know, you know, are you a Republican? Um, are you a Democrat? You know, that's, we don't want to get into that. That touches on these, which are protected classes. And uh, genetic is is one I threw in there. Sexual orientation is something we don't have to worry about on a national level, but most um, states uh, north of the Mason-Dixie line, um, you know, have some sort of sexual orientation prohibition, discrimination prohibition. A lot of companies also just internally prohibit it just because it's the way of the world and it's where things are going now. But at a federal level, we don't have sexual orientation discrimination, but I still put it down as a protected class because I think it's it's appropriate for, for um, you know, most companies in most states. Um, so these are the protected classes. This is what we want to watch out for when we're doing the interviews. We don't want to ask questions that touch on these issues. And if they do touch on these issues, there's got to, there better be a legitimate reason for it. And the legitimacy of the reason is going to drive off what the essential functions of the job are, which are going to be in the job description. And I think that's probably the dozenth time I've said. So I'm going to try not to say that again, but that's where we care about protected. We need to understand what the protected classes are. I don't think this is novel for anybody in HR, you know, don't ask, you know, so what, so that your last name, like, you know, Finkelhauser, like that's, is that like German or something? Or cause I don't like Germans. Um, or are you Jewish? I'm not really sure. You know, right? These are, 
that's beyond just being friendly. Um, that's, that's getting into information that is not essential for the job, doesn't touch on any of the eligibility criteria. Um, so could you ask, you know, for example, if you see, if you see that the person went to a religious based school, could you ask about their religious affiliation? No, not a good idea. Not unless you're a church, uh, like as an employer, uh, or something like that. But could you talk about the school and like, oh yeah, it's a good school. You know, I see you took, you know, you got your degree in this. Could you talk about that? It's a religious school. Absolutely. Uh, de getting into detail about who the person is, like who they choose to be, uh, not, not a good idea, but getting into the details of what they've accomplished, what, how they can meet the eligibility criteria, how they can perform the essential functions of the job. That's what we care about. And that's so we want to stay away from the protected classes unless it, unless they touch on uh, el necessary and eligi uh, the necessary eligibility criteria like my disability um, or you know the little walker scenario that I that I had mentioned before. Okay, so we're going to get the application. We're going to take a look at this. We're going to do some uh, preliminary screening of the application. We want to make we want to find out again if we put on there that it's a four year college degree requirement, um, college degree in in history. Well, we're going to nix everybody that doesn't have a history or an equivalent degree. We're going to do some sort of ranking uh, where at least we, or at least some sort of identification that these persons are qualified and maybe we've only got like three or four qualified candidates for the job. And then we're going to make a determination based on that. We're going to rank them in some, some manner, at least group them by people who are offered an interview, and people who are not being offered an interview. And for the people that are offered an interview, we then will offer the interview and there might be some sort of neutral ranking that we're applying, whether it's like a one to 10 scale or some sort of, you know, based on the, the experience and the application and the resume, or maybe the writing sample that they, that they submitted, like this seems to be going into the interview process, the preferred candidate. Um, for those people who weren't selected for an interview, you had at that point have the choice. Are you going to just send them a letter saying, thanks, thanks, but you know, we, we won't be interviewing you at this, at this time, or are you going to hold on to that? until the entire process is done, just in case none of the interview candidates work out and you want to dip back into the pool of, of um, applicants that you decided not to interview. Most companies will wait till the whole process is over before sending out any thanks but no thanks letters to people. Um, you're going to check references. Uh, you might do that. Normally you do that after the, um, and it's recommended to do it after the, you've had the interview. Uh, a lot of states have like the ban the box and have some sort of prohibitions on doing this. Normally it doesn't make sense to do, to do a whole lot of work in checking uh, references until you actually feel like you want to move on with the hiring process. But could you do it in, a, in advance? Yeah, you probably, you probably could if you wanted to but um, most companies don't. Okay, so time to interview. We're going to notify the candidates. We're going to probably do an email or give them a call, something like that. We might even do multiple types of interviews. So we might do a phone interview to assess eligibility. And then, um, you know, and then if they, if they uh, confirm the eligibility and talk just very briefly, and that generally is done with just HR. And then um, from that, HR will probably sift down and then give and then bring in the manager or multiple levels of management to do the actual uh, in-person interviews. I've, I've heard way too many horror stories about companies having multiple, multiple rounds of interviews. I think it's not a good practice. If you are meeting with HR for an in-person interview and the manager is not there, I think that's a problem from your, from your practice. HR should not be, it's kind of a waste of time, honestly. I think if you vetted, if you're going to do that, just do a phone interview. Don't do an in-person interview. HR people don't have enough time to do this. And really, what's an HR person going to, going to get? They're just going to get some information that they could get on the phone anyway, but they're not going to really fully understand the job like the manager or the supervisor is going to. So an in-person interview should almost always involve the manager or the supervisor. Having multiple, having more than just that interview can make sense, but in so many situations, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, to have more than like two rounds of interviews, unless you're, you're, um, the person who you're hiring is going to touch 
multiple different departments and groups of people within the organization. And then it might make sense that all those groups, departments, those groups of people that you just break up and you have multiple types of interviews, whether it's like two or three or four, whatever it is, but a different interview with each one of them, that can make some sense. Um, in that situation. But otherwise, I think too much process around interviewing, I think ultimately sends a bad message to the prospective employee and um, and may and probably comes across as way too bureaucratic for, um, you know, in a waste of a lot of people's time, including the applicants. So we're going to set up the appointments. We're going to track contacts, um, give the employee, the prospective employee, a full copy of the job description. You want to have it available during the job, the interview to talk about it. You are going to talk, you are going to prepare your, your um, questions and the questions are going to revolve around the uh, applicant's job description, their, their resume, and, and the job description for the company and what the eligibility criteria and what the duties are. And that's ultimately what you're trying to get because these are the three things, and this is from Forbes, but I have grown to love and adopt it. Um, you know, for personally, when I, when I do, do interviews and, uh, and then just, you know, in talking about this. So three basic things, you know, you might add more to it, but let's just break it down into three different categories. What are you really trying to accomplish in the interview? Can you do the job strengths, right? Will you love the job? Are you going to be motivated by the job? Are you going to show up for work? Are you going to be excited? Are you going to be uh, great for the team? Uh, can we tolerate working for you? Are you a fit for the cult culturally and with the team that you're being hired for? And, and I don't really know if you need more than the, these three things, you know, strengths, do you meet the eligibility? One thing we're seeing, I don't think this will come as too big of a surprise to anybody, is, um, is you know, that we're noticing, particularly when, when it comes to millennials, is that the criteria, the eligibility criteria for jobs, millennials meet in spades, very highly educated, lots of, you know, um, internships and, you know, <laughs> volunteer work. Um, but for the most part, the resume of a millennial looks pretty amazing, uh, especially if you look back, you know, uh, when I was a slug coming out of, uh, of undergrad from Madison, University of Wisconsin, go Badgers. Um, when I was coming out of Madison, I, you know, with my history degree, which was impressive, uh, I am sure I did, you know, did not wow anybody with, uh, with, you know, my, my, um, you know, great academic, uh, uh, credentials in in uh, European modern European history, and um, although I was very proud of them, um, you know, so I'm sure many of the businesses uh, that I went to interview with, and I think a couple of them actually told me um, that they were not terribly impressed, and they were wondering how I got got the interview, but I was able to talk my way through it. Um, so meeting the strengths, millennials, yes, very good. Here's where you get into issues with millennials: Are they going to have the motivation to stick with the company? Eh, probably not. Um, that's going to be a, that's going to be difficult. Obviously, obviously I'm just being very general here. We do uh, generational, you know, webinars all, uh, every year or two. You're welcome to watch some of my, um, great in-depth, uh, generational, uh, discussion on HR issues. If you, if you'd like on, um, the HR genius website, the, uh, motivation is going to be your issue, but you need to identify this when you're, when you're doing interviews. Um, is the person going to stick around? Are they going to be around for a year? Are they going to be around for two years? What are you really hiring for? If they're, if you don't get the sense that they're going to work for you for more than six months, does that work for this job or not? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Can they tolerate, can you tolerate working with them? Well, that's, that's just going to be a personality. I mean, you have to know the department. Um, just because HR might not like them, that doesn't mean that the supervisor, that that specific team, uh, doesn't, you know, wouldn't love, love the person, but you need to, you know, strengths, fit, motivation. That's ultimately what you're trying to get at. And that's why we need to have the job description. We're going to talk to the person that's going to drive the questions that we ask. And then here are, you know, some potential, potential um, unlawful questions. These are the easy ones, right? So are you married? I mean, I think most people, um, we should probably go back to HR school if we, if we ask that, but you know, who does ask stuff like that? managers, supervisors who don't know what they're doing. This is why, although managers and supervisors uh, should be in the interview with people, it's also why HR should also be there as the parent to make sure that they don't say stupid things because managers and supervisors, they are not 
HR people, HR professionals who know not to ask if you, the person plans on getting pregnant. Um, you know, not a great, great idea. Now, if the person says, comes in and they look pregnant and they start talking about having a baby in a few weeks, could you ask, you know, about that as a human being might, might ask, uh, when they're meeting other human beings? Yes, you could ask if the person, if the person brings, brings it up. But again, these questions, otherwise they're potentially unlawful. Uh, and do they ultimately get to the eligibility criteria and can the person do the job? Probably not. What year do you gra did you graduate is annoying to me, but government agencies are starting to really crack down on it. I don't like it. I think it's fair to ask how much work experience the person has, but instead of asking when they graduated, because that's, that's um, an indirect reference to age, Instead of acting, asking when they graduate, what year they graduated, ask, you know, look at the resume, ask about gaps, ask about, you know, how is their experience working in such and such company, um, you know, that sort of thing. So we're going to, we're going to interview the person. We're not going to ask unlawful questions. We're going to ask just questions that we need to know to understand the strengths, the fit, and the motivation uh, with our organization or company. Then we're going to evaluate and we might have some, some neutral. We might ask all the people as part of the interview process. We might ask them to grade on a number of different um, assessments, criteria that we've laid out. And if you're, if you're an awesome HR person and you've put together this interview and you have identified criteria that are going to be key for, and you might even give it some sort of weighting, like we might with a, with a job review, with an annual performance review, you could even get some sort of weighting on this where everybody then, you know, scores uh, each interview, you know, scale of, let's just say one to five. And then you just take the person with the highest score. That could be a really great non-discriminatory way of doing it. And then you can ever, you could show if the person ever brings a lawsuit that no, no, here are the criteria that we evaluated you on. We evaluated on, you on, on education, on ability to perform jobs, on fit with the company, on motivation to work, you know, put the non-discriminatory criteria, have all the people in, involved in the interview process, score them one to five, take the candidate that has the best the best score. It's a great non-discriminatory uh, way to, to do it. And I, I think it's really nice HR practice, just takes a lot of time and effort that I know none of you have. So then we're gonna do the offer. Um, we're going to negotiate salary. Uh, we're going to do the offer letter. I'd already talked about that. We're going to do any sort of pre-employment testing. We're going to check social media. You might not check social media. I recommend checking social media. Now, there are some states that have prohibited employers from asking for Facebook login accounts. You know, some companies have been out there saying, hey, you know, send me your login and password so I can check your Facebook to make sure you're not a complete blight on society. Um, so you probably don't want to do that. So instead, just check Facebook, check Instagram, whatever, and you, you know, may, may or may not find that they're a blight on society that way. Um, people post stupid stuff on Facebook all the time um, in great amounts of volume. And if you find that somebody's got, you know, um, white supremacist type of ideas and you see that all over Facebook, it, they might not be a good fit for your organization. Can you, can you make a determination that they wouldn't be a good fit based on what you find on social media? Absolutely. Do you need to follow fair credit reporting stuff and do adverse employment, uh, uh, at the adverse notice letter? No, we only have to worry about background checks when we do fair credit reporting. We only need to worry about compliance with that when we do background checks through a third party consumer reporting agency. If you in HR or the manager is just checking Facebook or checking Google and finding a bunch of crazy stuff uh, about an employee or prospective employee and you wanna you know fire them over that or withdraw the offer over that, you don't need to do the adverse notice uh, letter. That's only when you're using a CRA, a consumer reporting agency. I've already talked about this, so I actually kind of talked ahead about job to, um, the offer letter and what and what that entails. I think I forgot to say it should have the starting the starting date, the prospective starting date. Um, if we're doing that, here's some information on drug testing. If you are uh, an employer in the great state of Minnesota or Iowa or um, one of several states that has a drug testing statute, then you are going to need to follow. If you want to do pre-employment drug testing, you're going to need to have a written policy and you're going to need to follow it. Um, 
one question that comes up, especially as cannabis has be kind of kind of become a, a big lawful thing in many states, is can you can you still do pre employment drug testing in like Colorado, for example, or California, which has which has legalized cannabis. Uh, Minnesota has as well, but under very limited circumstances. A lot of states have. Um, can you do pre employment drug t screening and you know hit people for it, you know if they've um, tested positive? And the answer is yeah, you could you could still do pre employment drug screening. What I always say about drug testing is it's really just a stupid test um, if you're notifying the person in advance that they. Um, that they need to pass a drug test in order to get the job, they probably should somehow figure out a way to not test positive um, for that. And if they're too stupid to, to either comply, not take drugs, or figure out a way to water down the um, the sample that they're giving, I, they probably you probably don't want them working for you for you anyway. They sound like a problem. They they'll probably get a work comp injury in the first week anyway, um, having something fall on their head. So uh, you know, there you go. There's the reason why you want to do drug testing um, if it's not a CDL driver type of situation. Okay, so background check. I already mentioned that if you're using a CRA, Consumer Reporting Agency, you're going to need to do a pre-adverse notice in writing and then at least seven days, ideally more, but at least seven days later if the person hasn't you know, responded and corrected whatever you found in the background check through the CRA, then, um, then you're going to need to do in writing an adverse notice action. Now, if you're withdrawing the offer for a multitude of reasons, including what you found in the background check, you still need to do the pre-adverse notice. That's how the FR FCRA works. Um, if it's if what you found in the background check is at least in part the reason for why you're withdrawing the offer, you need to do the letter. You need to do the the two letters, the pre-adverse uh, notice and then the adverse notice. Skill testing physicals, can you do them? Yes. Should you have a validation study showing that there's a relationship between what is being tested, whether it's physically or or skill wise, a validation study showing the relationship between the testing and between the essential duties of the job. Yes, that's what you should have validation study to show that it's because you while you can do post offer pre employment testing, um, it can be risky, particularly with med with um, with physicals, because it can touch on inf on receiving information regarding somebody's disability, and we don't want to disparately impact people who are you know either because of their gender or because of um, physical impairments uh, or age even. Be if the testing that we're doing is not reasonably related to the the requirements, the uh, eligibility requirements that we have for the job and the primary uh, duties that we have for the job. So we just have to be very careful and make sure that we're doing this. Um, and if you're doing physical testing and, and skill-based testing, this is definitely not something we just would like whip out. We hire third parties uh, to do that sort of thing, and they should be all over doing this sort of validation study and, and analysis to see what type of testing can be done uh, for the specific job. And it's expensive too, so you know, again, this is not just to mess around with. This is to hire a third party uh, agency to come in and, and uh, do consulting for you to do it. Okay, I have two minutes and I'm on the last slide and I feel really good about that. Um, so for, uh, we've talked about a lot of this, um, but these are just some tips, some tips, ideas, you know, things to, things to take away. Use multiple sources for recruiting. Uh, Indeed, Career Builder, the sites of the, you know, newspapers, um, use, you know, newspapers plus online, use job fairs plus online. Online is great because it's super non-discriminatory. You know, computers don't discriminate based on race or age. Um, they might discriminate kind of based on age because you, you don't have to know how to use a keyboard. But for the most part, computers, computers, access to the internet is pretty non-discriminatory. Anybody, no matter how rich or poor they, they are, they can find a computer to get on the, to get on the internet. Um, and so doing internet recruiting is a really good idea. Watch out for doing word of mouth type of recruiting. Have a plan when you're interviewing. Um, you know, have the questions, the areas in advance. If you're going to do, if you're going to do scaling and um, and talk to all the the people that are part, going to participate in the interview and do some sort of um, you know ranking, that's great. 
do do that, draft it up in advance, go over it with management. I know this takes a lot of time, but it's really worth it. And again, we get that we get back to the thirty percent, the thirty percent cost on average for a bad hire. Um, and when you look at it that way, the work that you do in HR and and to involve the managers is really well well worth it. Uh, when you're talking about oh, that's a backpack showing up, strange. Um, is well well worth it um, as an investment um, to try to avoid and try to hire somebody who's great for the company and can be really productive, and then you don't have to you know do it do it again. So time up front is really a big deal. If you're doing restrictive covenants, non compete, non solicitation, confidentiality, all that sort of thing, have it signed off before the first day. Depending on the state, even completing it on the first day could be too late you might not have what we call consideration for it. So definitely have it done before the first day. I wouldn't let anybody start before they sign it or at least do it immediately upon showing up in the office. Don't wait. The I-9 needs to be completed as well by the end of the first day, at least section one does. The, uh, the, the one page uh, needs to be completed on the first day. The third day for, for section two where you review all the, all the documents. I think having a different an understanding of, of generational differences and expectations and how they get into the strengths, the fit and the motivation, I think that's well, well worth it. And I, I think any sort of training that HR people can get on generational differences, I think that sort of information is helpful and will and, um, and is worth your, your time up front. And then the last thing I wanna talk about really quick is the ADA. And just to, as a reminder, the ADA doesn't cover just employees. It also covers applicants at the interview process. If somebody requires requests to interview that you do an accommodation for them, you are legally required under the law to provide a reasonable accommodation for the interview. So for example, if you don't have an elevator at your, at your business, but you have multiple floors and you normally do the interview on like the second floor and the applicant is wheelchair bound, and they and you don't have an, an elevator or a way to get them get them up the stairs, for example. Should you know? And they tell you that. Can you move the interview to a, the, a main floor or somewhere else where the person can access you for the interview? You are required to do so. Uh, has to be reasonable and all that. But just to, as a you know general practice point, you are required to accommodate for the interview process itself as well. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, this is October two, uh, 2018. Next month, November 2018, we will talk about, we'll have a discussion about how I fired a uh, problem, a serial killer, um, and discipline and termination tips and strategies and all that. If you have any questions, you're welcome to reach out to me uh, about this webinar or anything else at uh, kmosier at thompsonco.com or by calling 651 Three eight nine five zero zero seven. I appreciate your time and attendance, and I will talk to you next month. Thank you.